Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Dobrý večer. Let me welcome you to the next session taking place as part of this unique event, Freedom Games 2021. My name is Natalia Marákova. I am a project manager at the Prague office of Friedrich Neumann Foundation for Freedom, and I have a pleasure to moderate this roundtable dedicated to the topic, how to rebrand liberalism. At the beginning, I would like to thank to the European Liberal Forum for its kind support of this event. And when speaking about partners, I would also like to mention that our foundation, Friedrich Neumann Foundation for Freedom, is a long-standing uh, and a very proud partner of Freedom Games. As already mentioned, in the upcoming one and a half hour, we will be discussing the tip big topic of how to revive liberal ideas in today's world, and we will be dealing with the question if and possibly how liberalism should be rebranded in order to regain perhaps somewhat lost public support and trust. This topic is actually very topical because it seems that over the last two decades, uh, liberal democracies have indeed run into difficulties. Especially in recent years, we have been witnessing a growing support for parties and movements that often question and even oppose and reject some un um, underpinning principles of liberal democracies, such as pluralism or equal freedom to all. Many of these movements actually perceive liberal institutions such as free press or independent judiciary not as protections against abuse uh, of public power, but rather as obstacles uh, to, on their way to, to effective governance. And thus it seems that the threats posed by so-called illiberal democracies are growing. It's, however, were important to remind that rule of law, human rights, and constitutional liberal democracy are actually still foundations of the current world order, uh, and uh, they are somehow also out outcomes of the liberal initiative in the past. Uh, yeah, and we should remember that this should be also our guiding principles for the future. So ladies and gentlemen, I think that right now is the right moment to introduce you our panelists, who are actually the key persons of, of this discussion today. So first, it's my big pleasure to introduce you uh, Ms. Uh, Elena Leontieva. You cannot see her on the screen right now, but uh, I hope that she will appear soon. Hi, Elena. Uh, great, now we see you. Uh, Elena is a co-founder of the Lithuanian Free Market Institute, which was actually established uh, back in 1990. She acted as its president from 1993 until 2001, and she was also one of the architects of major economic and social reforms in Lithuania back in 90s. And currently, she is the president of LFMI again. Welcome, Elena. Um, secondly, it's my big pleasure to introduce you Sharka Prat, uh, who is also joining, joining us uh, online today from Prague. Uh, she is the executive director of the Czech Liberal Think Tank Institute for Politics and Society, and she is also member of board of the European Liberal Forum. It's great to have you here, Sharka, or not here, literally, but joining us online. Um, Good evening, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, then it's my big pleasure to introduce you two gentlemen sitting in front of you. Uh, so I will start with Ricardo Silvestre, who is International Officer of Movimiento Liberal Social, Social Liberal Think Tank in Portugal. And you might also know him as a host of Liberal Europe podcast of the European Liberal Forum. Welcome, Ricardo. Then uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you Piotr Benyushis, uh, who is a translator, political scientist, and also sociologist, and he is expert in history of liberalism and evolution of Western European liberal parties. It's nice to have you here, Piotr. And we were supposed to have uh, also uh, the fifth speaker, Daniel Mikec, joining us, so let's hope that he will, he will join us, join us uh, a bit later. Uh, before we start with the discussion, I would just like to point out that in approximately 50 minutes or one hour, the floor will be open for your questions. So please feel free to take the opportunity to prepare your questions and ask our panelists. Good. Okay, so 
I hope that everybody is ready. And let's start with uh, the first opening question to all the panelists. Uh, actually, when speaking about liberalism, one can get a little bit confused because the word liberal carries quite different meanings in different uh, national political traditions. Moreover, some liberals are more focused on economic freedoms, others rather on progress in social issues. Some perceive liberalism more as a political philosophy, others as an approach, a way of living. So you all consider yourself to be like true liberals. And my first opening question to all of you would be, what does liberalism mean to you? And I would ask you for your input, let's say about two minutes each. So exactly, yeah, we will start with you, Elena. So what does liberalism mean to you? Hello, everybody. I had to find out what is liberty when looking for a solution out of the socialist uh, imperial life uh, in which we were all locked and I was looking for uh, an ideas uh, which would return a human being its dignity, its ability to labor and to provide bread for the family and to be sustainable without stealing from the state as was a rule in the Soviet times. So when I read my first Hayek book, The Road to Serfdom, I said, yes, yes, that is exactly how it should be. So for me, the idea of liberty is something which is a very inner idea. This is the, really the way of looking at a human being, at our community, at our way of uh, production and exchange. So this is something very dear to which I have a passion. Thank you very much for that input, Sharka. May I ask you, what does liberalism mean to you? Well, I think that uh, liberalism can be characterized by its openness and tolerance. And uh, for me, liberalism means being open to new ideas, people, and perhaps most importantly, challenges. And the world is unpredictable and often trying, but liberalism offers a resilient and progressive approach to issues. And uh, liberalism is unique due to its profound defense of the individual while emphasizing the needs of society overall. And in this way, people are free to contribute their distinctive abilities and viewpoints, celebrating differences and diversity. And individuals, after all, are capable of great critical thinking, which are often uh, divergent in ideas and creating dialogue can lead to crucial new developments and a more open, connected world. And as a result, society and its uh, many debates are farther enriched, but its uh, betterment is not forgotten. And this is in some ways uh, the essence of liberalism, finding a balance and between the individual and the community, between the complete freedom and the state or regulation and the free market. And uh, respecting individuality also means caring for others and standing in solidarity with your community. And liberalism means uh, uni uniting around certain shared values such as freedom, equality, or democracy and individual rights and applying them to create a better society for everybody in it. And the political institutions uh, should be utilized to always further these goals keeping in mind the issues addressed uh, shouldn't be in the interest of only one group of people, but rather as many as possible. And we can say that liberalism means uh, recognizing the importance of government to create necessary developments and security for its citizens. Security meaning much more than just safety in a military sense, uh, but also related to health and standards of living, encompassing climate change and social welfare, and this allows for the individual to grow and reach their full potential, letting the governments to organize shared responsibility. Thank you very much. Piotr, would you like to continue? Yes. Well, of course, um, we all know that liberalism um, is a set of principles in the three major fields, the political and legal system, when you have uh, elements like uh, support for constitutional rights, rule of law, and separation of powers. 
the second field being the ethic outlook for a society where liberalism is uh, set on guaranteeing every individual the right to live, live freely according to their values and, and uh, the vision of, of life. And uh, an economical order where we can find such elements like free market and private property and so on. But to me, the underlying uh, reason uh, and understanding of liberalism is that, the li that liber liberalism is a moral cause. That's what's really binding all these three elements together. It's a moral cause, that's how it started and what it is still today, because the major aim of liberalism is to make it possible for a diverse group of people, a society, a community, a nation, people of different values, different religions, different ethnic backgrounds, different ideas of a good life, to live together, or at least next to each other in peace, tolerance, and respect. So liberalism differs from every other ideology in the history of humanity that it is said to find a way for people to coexist instead of coercing other people to live the way a majority or those who are in power would like them to live. So in the end, it's a moral cause because it's a way to, uh, to uh, eliminate cruelty from the uh, existence, from the relations between people, to allow other people to live the way they want to, instead of coercing them to live the way we would like them to live. Thank you. Ricardo, could you conclude this round? Absolutely. And I have a mission today is not to make Natalia nervous about time. So I promise that I'll finish during my time. But I have to take 30 seconds here to say something. And in the presence of Blaget here with us, how amazing Freedom Games are. And how valuable is this? This is incredible. Of course, I come from a country where we can do things like this. That's fine. Not too much in the liberal area, but we do stuff like this. But to have a, a liberal forum, this well organized, this well put in place, reaching to the community, having the community reach back, seeing that auditorium filled with people. Blaje, congratulations. This is amazing. Thank you so much for having me. It's always fantastic to be here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, a round of applause. Not for me, for Blaje and for uh, Liberté. Now, I have the American training, which is I can speak really fast. Sorry, I can make my arguments really short. And after this fantastic introductions, I just have to say this. For me, liberalism, it's more and more the voice of reason and the voice of common sense. So what I mean by that polarization, both from the left and from the right, they are stretching so much right now that I think liberalism will be at least a solution to have something in the middle that makes sense and have people be drawn to it. Because one thing, and this is my final point, one thing I believe, I truly believe is going to happen with this, again, people getting against each other, is there gonna be a lot of people that don't identify with that. There's gonna be a lot of people. This is not how I see the politics. This is not how I see society. This is not how I see culture. So I think liberalism in that way can be even more a solution for those people that just want common sense, good governance, good values and good ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your answers. I think that you quite nicely outlined like these different perspectives of how we can understand liberalism, but when still emphasizing like the common values such as freedom and tolerance, dialogue, common sense, as you just said. Um, so I think that with this, we prepared the ground for our next discussion in which I, was, I would firstly like to shed some light um, on the reasons why liberalism might be struggling nowadays. Uh, Elena, so first question to you. As already mentioned, liberal democracy faces multiple challenges nowadays, and one of them uh, is growing support for populist movements, uh, which are actually trying to drive a wedge between liberalism and democracy. And if we try to address the reasons uh, why populist movements uh, are gaining so much ground globally at cost of liberalism, what would be your reflection on that? How do you understand and explain this phenomenon? Uh, the only way to go ahead with your question is to understand human being and to understand our natural inclination to have order 
safety uh, and also to save energy. So from this understanding, we can uh, see how more and more people are inclined to believe that a human being has a superpower to establish an order which would be better than the spontaneous order. So we have to explain the beauty and the complexity of the spontaneous order so that people could really understand that liberty does not mean chaos. It means some order. Uh, liberty does not mean complete in safety. And uh, people must go into understanding how this safety, which is established only by the state power, how it takes away their liberty. All this, all this. And of course, as I mentioned, people are inclined to save energy. So if they are offered free food, so to say, a possibility to get some way of living without action, without labor, more and more people would be inclined to accept uh, this possibility. And there is no other way as to explain that only by facing our challenges, by facing our need to make the bread for today and tomorrow, we can become who we are called to become. We can really fulfill ourselves. We can learn, uh, we can meet each other, we can exchange, we can understand the needs of the other people so that we can serve the other. This is the essence of the market, to serve the other. So a lot of beautiful uh, things can be to, uh, communicated to the people who are looking for the order, for the way of a peaceful life. Also, as my colleagues already mentioned, of course, uh, liberty and free markets is the only system which can really uh, be peaceful, uh, provide for peaceful cooperation. Without free exchange, the only way to, to have your bread is either to live on, a, on some subsidies, on redistribution, or is, as it was the rule in the older times, uh, to go and kill people in the other village when you have no, have no food in your village. So to explain all this beauty and all these natural uh, roots of liberty uh, and of free way of living, I think this is really the beautiful challenge uh, that we all uh, share today. Thank you, Elena. And let's stick to the topic of populism for a bit longer. But now let's take a look at some more specific example. Uh, Piotr, we are now in Poland in your home country. And in liberal circles, it's being argued for some time that Poland is in recent years heading rather in the direction of a liberal democracy with the populist ruling party um, seeming to try to systematically weaken uh, liberal institutions such as free press and independent judiciary. And although it seems that the citizens, the people here realize like this curtailing of their freedoms, the ruling party still seems to enjoy quite great popularity. So what is the driving force behind, like let's say undermining belief in liberal values here? And why in general is liberalism rather portrayed in negative connotations here? Well, um, the, I have a few answers to this question. Uh, first of them is, uh, is mine, my favorite answer. Uh, I'm afraid this one is a boring one. Um, I will start with it though, uh, and then later I will, uh, I will tell you some other ideas I heard uh, from my colleagues uh, from different liberal circles in Poland. I talked with many people about that yesterday evening and even at breakfast today. And uh, I think some of the ideas are actually better than mine. But I'll start with mine. I see the collapse of the liberal democracy in Poland uh, to be the result of a global phenomenon. 
uh, which encompasses all of the Western world. Well, the current Polish government is produced by uh, similar powers uh, like Trump, Trump's victories or Salvini's entry into the gov uh, Italian government uh, or Le Pen getting closer and closer to clinching the French presidency. Uh, quite simply, weaker and less stable democracies, those who look back at a shorter history here in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, stand on weaker legs and uh, where in America after four years uh, they are able to oust a president such as Donald Trump and maybe reestablish the liberal democracy under Joe Biden then we are not so lucky because uh, in here these structures uh, didn't have enough time to really get, become strong ones. And uh, in comparison to, to other countries in the region like your country, the Czech Republic and others uh, where liberal democracy is still relatively well intact, well maybe we're just simply more unlucky than you. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's just that here they won and in other countries they didn't. But look at America, I mean Donald Trump now out of office for six months, some polls suggest he might have a chance to come back. So liberal democracy seems to be in crisis everywhere but of course there where it was the weakest in the beginning, in the first place, the problem the problems are deeper, and that's the case for Poland and Hungary and some other countries in this region. But as I said, uh, some other, maybe more insightful uh, answers were given by my colleagues, and I wrote this down, and I would like to uh, give some of them to you. Well, Polish liberals has, set, has uh, made the transition of 1989 and, uh, until 1991, and then late in the 90s, using books and textbooks and articles written by Western liberals. By some American thinkers, great people, of course, great minds, American thinkers, British thinkers, and German thinkers who wrote about liberalism in the 70s and 80s in their countries. And what they did in the 90s here was basically to use the copy and paste method. They just took that and introduced it here uh, and didn't uh, go for the intellectual challenge to create a own version of Polish liberalism that would be more accommodating to the local realities. That certainly is one of the explanations. The other one is that Polish liberals for the last 25 years until the current government took power, so between the transition and, and, 19, and 2015, had little to offer to people living outside of the 10 biggest cities in Poland. I myself uh, live in Gdansk, which is one of the biggest cities in Poland, and I live in a part of Gdansk where current Polish president, Mr. Duda, got 19% of the vote, which of course means that Mr. Trzaskowski, who will be speaking right there in, a, in an hour, got 81% of the vote, and we are all great liberals there, and we, are, we completely do not understand, my neighbors completely don't understand why peace is governing in Poland. Yeah? But on the other hand, I come from a small town of 25,000 uh, inhabitants, Kościerzyna, in the middle of Kashubian region. And I go there regularly and speak with uh, people who live there. And uh, they actually understand quite well, even if they don't support the current government, why they got in. So that's obviously a different perspective and a huge problem uh, when we look back at uh, the uh, liberal uh, activities in the last 25 years here. We neglected schools in Poland. Yeah, Polish liberals never really set up an uh, idea of a strong civic liberal school, public school. They thought that it's not that important and they left it to uh, anti-liberal ideas, clerical ideas, conservative ideas, old-fashioned patriotism to basically run school. And that's what went into the heads of young people and these are the results. And finally, I like this especially, uh, they failed to realize a value-based agenda when they were in government between 2007 and 15. They concentrated on building infrastructure but all the identity-related aspects, the world of values, strong emotions, all that was left to be picked up by the liberal conservatives. Of course, it's great to have a new football field at your local school when your kids can play and 
paths for bicycle where you can safely uh, ride a bicycle to, to your workplace. These are all great things, but these are not things that will people really get involved with a lot of emotion behind you in politics. They cannot stand a fight against patriotism and history and dignity and pride. And this was completely neglected. So there you go. Thank you, Piotr. Actually, you raised many points which could be now developed further, so I will pick one of them. You actually uh, started like with this um, self-reflection self of liberalism, so to say. And that would be my next question to Ricardo. Uh, when the liberals look at, uh, at the lack of support for liberalism nowadays, how, how should they actually look at, at this decline in support and how should their self-reflection look like? It's a great question. Uh, first of all, great point, Piotr. Uh, liberalism is also regional. And later I would like to go back to this. I think I, I can expand this just a little bit with is you're just mentioning populism. And it is quite interesting that I've been thinking about this for some time now until Natalia sent me her sheet list that she has with her. And I was like, wow, it's a good time for me to introduce this idea. We suffer a lot of problem of people thinking that liberalism is for the elites. Well, if you have food on your table, then you can worry about freedom. Well, the thing is, uh, well-being comes from freedom. Unless you want to live in a state that is a, a, an illiberal democracy, and Piotr, you were just saying that, and now all of a sudden it looks like it's all the rage. Hungary has that, the Chinese have that, the other countries want to have that. Then the deal is, yeah, we'll put food on your table, but we'll take your freedoms away. There'll be no freedom of press, there'll be no freedom of association, no free of representation, no free of due process, and we see that in Poland. There's no freedom of love. So us as liberals, we need to make people understand that liberalism, it's actually a political philosophy or a political ideology of the people. And here, I would like to bring, and this is my final point, because I would really love to have the audience participate in this and my fellow panelists. It always brings me to Abraham Lincoln. And I'm sure all of you know his, family, his famous speech at Gettysburg. It's called the Gettysburg Address, where he, he said that this nation should have a birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So my contribution here, and I'm going to be, I'm going to finish now, is let's have a liberalism of the people, by the people, and for the people. So let's rebrand liberalism to make liberalism closer, like Piotr was saying, regional. Maybe even if it's nation state, it has to be adapted and he has to go and put himself so that people can join us, so that people understand that all the values and ideas from liberalism, it's what they need for well-being. So that's my contribution. Thank you, Ricardo. Perhaps a quick follow-up question. First of all, you like you don't need to worry about our time management. I'm, I'm checking it, and actually, we are doing quite well. Uh, but you said liberalism or for the people, by the people, uh, from the people. Uh, the thing is, like, how exactly, how should we get closer to the people? Because this is a very nice idea, but what, for example, I, as an individual, can, can do? Wonderful question. And again, Piotr opened the door for this conversation, which is, don't be just an academic of liberalism. Don't go and read the great literature. I totally agree with you with that. The great literature of liberalism that has been written since the 1700s, which is fine, no problem with that. My master dissertation was based on, on liberty, so it couldn't be any more like getting the classicals to help me. But answering your question, and Piotr already, already like I said, he, he started this conversation. It says, go to the field, go to the park, go to Freedom Games. Get close to people and explain them that liberalism is not this boogaboo that, all right, people in Brussels, they have liberalism, and, and people in Warsaw, they have liberalism. That is not the best way to rebrand liberalism. Uh, 
And we have to have a language, we have to have terms, we have to have a story, a narrative to tell people and make those people feel passionate about it and not just go like vague concepts of freedom and economic freedom. No, don't make it vague, make it really precise. This is what you need for you to have well-being, for you to have prosperity. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, Okay, so it's a great pleasure to welcome here our fifth panelist, Daniel Mikic. No, no worries. Here now. So, yeah, we can't hear you, so if you could take yeah, your microphone. If you, if you, if you nap and you don't set your clock, that's an app roulette. Sorry for, for doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much for finding me here, and sorry for the delay. Great, you made it finally. So your questions will follow. Now you can take some breath uh, and you will follow with a question to Sharka. Sharka, I know that you are an expert on economic issues and I would actually uh, like uh, to take a look now at the crucial context of, of the pandemic time and impact it had on liberalism. So how would you say that liberalism in economic terms was influenced by the pandemic? And would you say that the pandemic has in general led to weakening of, of liberalism? Thank you for this question. Uh, well, I think that the start of the pandemic uh, in early 2020 brought on a major international recession, which some parts of the world are only just now beginning to come out of, and the majority is still entrenched uh, in crisis. And there has, however, been an increasing pressure to lift lockdowns due to its results on the economy, despite the virus still being a prominent issue, like it was in the Czech Republic. Uh, but nonetheless, the aftermath of this pandemic from an economic perspective is something that needs uh, addressing. And the free market, uh, once largely the dictated uh, by supply and demand, uh, which previously guided liberal economies has been completely derived by pandemic regulations and could also continue to be under attack uh, even as uh, regulations decrease as critic of globalization arises as a result of the detrimental effects of the pandemic on supply chains. Uh, and this could in turn further protectionist uh, tendencies, uh, a threat to crucial economic growth. And the economic health has meant uh, financial struggles for many individuals, but it has also meant a rise in, in uh, inequality, as in many instances, the rich got richer and uh, vice versa for the less wealthy. Uh, and addressing this will be crucial, especially considering rising inequality also means declining trust in institutions. I previously mentioned uh, and in Europe in particular, liberal parties and liberal efforts have been to create a fairer and more equal society, resulting in a rising inequality being a threat to the livelihood of liberalism. And yet, uh, once again, it provides a chance to address issues which uh, were already present and have simply been uh, exacerbated by this pandemic. And another important factor to be considered is that the economic, uh, uh, the, or the, the concentration of uh, wealth, which consistently grows as a result of uh, socioeconomic inequality also means concentration of power, which is uh, unfit to protect socially diverse uh, liberal states. And the concentration of power is also what leads to distrust of governments as they should be kept uh, in check and uh, again, populist leaders. And uh, what can be done to prevent this? So uh, while well, states can ensure needs are met by prioritizing uh, certain liberal values, such as appropriately distributing wealth uh, and putting more value in social welfare and education and creating a fair society means um, meeting people's needs and providing equal opportunities. So just to sum up, the outbreak of COVID-19 has risen several discussions concerning the liberal order of governments. Uh, 
the pandemic severely affected the global economy in forms of uh, income reduction, uh, rise in unemployment and disruption of financial markets, such as a trade disruption or decline of tourism or business closures and the shutting down of the entire sectors. And from the liberal perspective, many called for a collective international response to the pandemic and intensified uh, cooperation among countries of international community. And the states were focused on containing the disease uh, by allocating large amounts of financial help to hospitals. Uh, and the, for example, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund uh, provided over 100 billion of dollars to combat the virus. However, the current liberal order of globalization and economic interconnectedness also made the containment of the virus more difficult and expensive, which raised questions about the efficiency of liberal order during the times of a global pandemic. And in general, in the realistic perspective, the outcomes of the global pandemic, such as uh, limited advantages of the liberal globalized world, such as limited uh, cross-border movement, contributed to a realist argument uh, that nation state remains the main actor in international politics. And from the realistic perspective, the pandemic reinforced uh, the restoration of state power and uh, weakened international institutions. And the criticism of the World Health Organization by the United States also contributed to undermining of liberal order during the pandemic. Thank you, Sharka. Um, you actually mentioned that the pandemic made it easier for, like, let's say, populist populist leaders to concentrate power. And when speaking about concentrating power, it actually quite nicely connects to my next question, this time directed to Daniel. Uh, Daniel, we were speaking actually about the reasons, about specifically about Poland, uh, why uh, the right-wing populists are actually still enjoying such a great popularity, although the people actually recognize like that they are curtailing their, their freedoms. And uh, I would be like, or a very similar question from Hungarian perspective. Uh, given the popularity of Viktor Orban in Hungary, would you say uh, that the values such as liberal democracy, freedom, human rights, uh, rule of law, that they are, they, that there is a different perception of them in Hungary or Central and Eastern Europe in general than in the West? Well, great question. If, if, uh, if, 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 if we could actually uh, just directly answer this question, then uh, it would be the treasure for the, uh, for the opposition in Hungary and in other countries as well. I think it's, uh, there's a lot behind of the popularity of uh, Viktor Orban and of, also of, of, of uh, PIS in Poland. And there are Probably several developments recently. Uh, you know, in East Central Europe, there's also actually a kind of a historical tradition or a historical heritage, which gives uh, a huge support for this uh, for these parties. But also, on the other hand, you can see recent developments also in the United States or in the UK. If you think about Brexit, or if you think about the. Uh, how Trump just won in 2016, which at the same time, you know, in the West, people are talking about the losers of the globalization, so to say the losers, I, I don't like this term because uh, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> it's not nice to call people losers, but uh, in the East, people are talking about, so to say, the losers of system transformations. So like blue collar vo workers who lost their jobs, who lost their uh, identity, who, uh, who think that maybe uh, the populist leaders, as also as Shaka put it, or, or right-wing leaders can uh, give them some kind of uh, back their honor, or maybe they can, they can help to uh, give a kind of an identity which can help them to overcome uh, several uh, troubles, if these troubles are coming from globalization. So at the same time, I think in East Central Europe, we have uh, a historical tradition, you know, just being uh, the victim, victimization. Uh, it is never said on the right, but they are using victimization, like in Poland, that, 
you know, uh, the Western uh, countries, they never helped us during the Second World War because we've been here. Uh, we stood against Stalin and Hitler at the same time, and the French and the, uh, and, and, and the English, they just, they just stood there, they've been allies, they never helped us. It's a kind of victimization. In Hungary, in 1956, we had our uprising, but the, uh, the Western powers, they, they did nothing. So there's this kind of victimization, we are alone. We can count on ourselves. We protected Europe, says the Hungarian Prime Minister, uh, when it came to the Turks in the 16th century. I mean, 500 years ago, right? So it's kind of uh, grievances which are uh, almost, uh, uh, yeah, more, you can date it back for, for 500 years. But still, the Hungarian Prime Minister claims that we, we defended uh, the Christian Europe from Muslims in, in the Middle Ages, alone, without any help, which is basically not true because uh, the house rule, they give a lot of money for uh, building uh, fortresses, whatever. So my, my point is that there are these historic grievances on the one hand, and there are these new grievances that we are again alone because everyone is just going to hurt our national sovereignty, the EU, the, the UN, uh, the data or not yet, but still, and they are put, you know, kind of uh, uh, mixed together, and this is what they offer to their voters. And it resonates quite well, because what do people learn in the school? Yeah, we've been alone. We defended Christian Europe. Uh, we've been not treated well in 1956 or in uh, 1939 in Poland, whatever. So this is, I think, uh, that kind of framing of grievances, and this is kind of a framing of the West, which resonates well uh, uh, for the voters of Kaczynski and Orban. And this is actually how you sell uh, their policies as well. And then the people don't care about policies, about corruption, uh, about uh, if the policies are doing well, they, they care about if, uh, if these promises, if if their governments are fighting well and if they are actually succeeding with their conflicts with Germany in the case of Poland or with Brussels, an abstract enemy in the case of, uh, in the case of Hungary. So this is, this is actually, I think, which, which works pretty well. At the same time, it's always necessary for this kind of politics to look for new uh, uh, new enemies, so to say, to target new groups, like in the case of Hungary uh, recently, the, uh, the referendum against the, uh, which is basically against LGBTQ people. It happened also in, in Poland as well. So this is always find and target a new enemy and then just focus uh, this, the political action against them. And this is what makes this kind of politics in the motion. You always have to be in motion. It always has to move. It's a political machine. It always has to be, you, you need to find a new enemy, and this is what makes, can mobilize your voters, can mobilize your supporters. But at the end of the day, it just causes actually, according to my opinion, harm for the whole society and for the whole political community. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. Uh, Ricardo. I'm just gonna jump here for 30 seconds because I was asking uh, Natalia to give me a word and you were just entering exactly what I was going to say and that is be careful from a Western perspective and I follow American politics daily to my great chagrin of economic anxiety and economic discrepancy and economic inequality. There are deeper reasons than those ones. Those ones, yes, they're op operative and there's a larger population that suffer from that. But you were just getting, as you were ending exactly, it's also because they don't like minorities, they don't like liberalism, they don't like uh, globalization. So they you hide the themselves. the voters or the politicians, sorry? Just uh, the, the, the people. The people, so. Yes, and I'm talking about it's mostly an American phenomenon, but I think some countries in Europe, if we study that, we will also find out there's a large percentage of people that say, oh, this is economic anxiety. It's not. They're actually well in life. It's anti-liberalism that just surfaces, and then they will give voice to the populists. 
So I just wanted to add that because you made a yep. great point and I just, just wanted to extend it. But you're right, in this case, I think the point is uh, what people ask that, who, who are we, who belong to us? Who, who belongs to the, to the political community? Uh, what, what are the words, how we can define ourselves? Uh, are we Hungarians, it's, it's a nation, or it's a people, or it's a community, or it's a society? These actually matters, and this is actually I mean, I, I think at least that, uh, according to my opinion, in 2015 and during the refugee crisis, this is what Fidesz made in Hungary. Who can belong to a community? Are refugees welcome or not? It was not about uh, some kind of, you know, uh, uh, these uh, uh, conventions, how you treat uh, refugees, uh, the Dublin conventions, or who belongs to our community? Can we define that? that we are a political community or not. And this is what they made. This, this was the, their point. And I think this is what, what maybe I'm wrong, uh, you can if, I, if I'm wrong, but I think that was the point during the Brexit as well. Where do we belong? Uh, are we a part of the EU or not? Or should they say what sh we should do or not? And this is kind of, I think for a lot of people, it, uh, it was, at least it was, a question of, of uh, of, uh, uh, of some kind of political capacity, if they can act or not, if, if they can define their, uh, 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 not destiny, but, 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 but what they can do actually in, in, in the life. And this is actually what, what, uh, what as, as in populists are exploiting, this kind of uh, sentiments. Thank you. And actually, I forgot one important thing, and my apologies for that, I forgot to introduce Daniel. Uh, so Daniel Mikec is a political scientist, and he's a researcher at the Republi Repu Republican Institute in Hungary, and his main field of expertise are political participation and civil society. Okay, so with that, we actually closed the first round of, of questions when we were trying to like identify the problems and look at the reasons why liberalism is struggling nowadays. And now let's try to be more positive and to look for, for possible solutions. Elena, let me start with you again. Actually, as one of the founders of LFM Mind back in, back in 1990, you were one of the architects of major economic and social reforms in Lithuania. And my question would be, how did you manage to get public support for introducing liberal reforms in a country which was, after many years of socialist rule, actually used to a completely different economic system and set of values? And the second part of this question would be, can we draw from this uh, any inspiration nowadays when speaking about ideas how to revive liberalism. Right. Uh, we were at the point when people had no illusion that by continuing the socialist rule, we can remain alive, we can feed ourselves, we can get out of this complete shortage of everything. Uh, you know that in Hungary, Poland, and other countries, uh, there were some products on the shelves, but in the former Soviet Union, uh, the shelves in the stores were almost empty. And so people had a very vivid understanding that only by going to private property and to true exchange, free exchange, we can feed ourselves, we can get out of, of this trap of socialism. So we really had a good support to privatization and Lithuania started privatization at the same time as the Czech Republic and we had voucher privatization. So every citizen had an opportunity to become an owner either of a share in a company or of his own apartment or of a piece of land, and it was very important education of people. So with the Free Market Institute, we immediately understood that we need also to establish institutions to allow people to become truly private owners. And so one of our first initiative was to uh, draft uh, legal uh, fundamentals for the securities market and the stock exchange so that people 
could uh, get information about the shares of their companies, could trade freely on the market, uh, so the information would be disclosed to them. So it was really making and educating people at the same time. And I remember frequently the, the rulers, like the prime ministers, would ask uh, me, is it a free market solution if we were suggesting some package of reforms? And if I would say yes, they, they were really sure that this is what the country needs. In other words, we really were at the such point of devastation that we really had to go back to the roots of humanity and of a normal condition of a human life, a human exchange, labor. And these ontological roots are very important. Also, as one of the godmothers of Lithuanian a currency vote, which uh, established a, a stable um, and healthy uh, national currency for many uh, years until we joined the euro zone, I may say that it was important to explain to people that money really has to, to become the mark of scarcity of resources. And I would like to reflect to yesterday's note by Yuval Harari uh, about the money as a fictional creation and so on. I think this is very, very far from the roots on which we can really base our free society. And only by understanding those natural ontological roots of such phenomena as uh, money, exchange, private property, and responsibility, only by this understanding can we uh, recover the uh, human support uh, to liberty, uh, to free way of living and exchanging uh, uh, what we can produce to each other, how we can serve to each other. So in those first years of uh, independence and uh, establishing the free uh, society, uh, people really had a very strong support and eagerness to learn the new rules of the game and to adapt to these new rules. And as uh, Piotr mentioned, the role of morality, I think it's it's incredible role. And therefore, today, the Lithuanian Free Market Institute also writes textbooks for school children uniting the studies of economy with the studies of ethics and citizenship so that people in the very young age can understand that economy and private property and business is not against morality, is not something outside morality that people could really learn how important it is to build the knowledge and the uh, virtues, the moral virtues, so that we can really sustainably live with each other. And that understanding of the moral roots and the economic knowledge goes hand in hand in the young people. I hope that such young people can really be understanding that the way to prosper in life is by taking the responsibility for their dreams, for their ideas, what they want to produce, what they want to create. And uh, this responsibility is called private property. There is no other way for us to, to flourish but to take those, that responsibility. So uh, to go back to your question, at that time, the support was very strong, but later on, at the uh, late 90s, we got a lot of know-how from the EU, from the Western world, about uh, redistribution, about the welfare state, uh, a lot of uh, training to groups like trade unions and so on, how to defend their rights. 
And it created a lot of uh, tension in the society between people. And, uh, and we continue, unfortunately, to, to live in, in this tension. Uh, so uh, when people really have to find the order which can provide bread and peaceful cooperation, they look for liberty and for economic liberties. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. You actually raised one very interesting um, and important point, the importance of economic education. So thank you for bringing that. Actually, I would also say that it's something which is quite often underestimated and then it means quite a lot of problems for, for the future. So thanks for bringing this point. Um, and actually, Piotr, let me continue with a question to you. Uh, sometimes it's being argued that liberalism is a work in perpetual progress and that in order to make it work, it needs constant adjustments. Um, would you agree with that, that we need to update liberalism in order to make it work? Uh, and in general, like, what would be your suggestions of how to, how to revive liberal ideas? Um, do we need to... Uh to adjust liberalism. I'm happy about that question because uh, I can give you the classic uh, liberal answer. Yes and no. Um, I agree with that to some point. Uh, the history of liberalism shows that it uh, had a remarkable adjustment ability and flexibility in pretty much every single new generation of liberals in the 19th and uh, to some extent the 20th century redefined liberalism, looking at new realities, new problems, new facts. Yeah? If the facts change, I change my mind. That's what John Maynard Keynes said, we know that. Um, and also the liberal process of reform is always gradual, never revolutionary and rational. So uh, basically the liberal method is that when we have a problem and we try to think of a solution and then we try to put that solution into work and then we look if it does work and if it doesn't and we're not trying to do the same for the second, third or fourth time but we try to do something else. So obviously liberalism is open to, to adjustments and adaptations. My problem with the current debate about the crisis and the future of liberalism, and many books and articles have been written about that by uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon authors and uh, Polish authors as well, I read many of them in the last few years, that, is that they often suggest a very deep revolution of liberalism. Basically, many of these authors say that that the liberalism that we knew is finished, and if any of it shall survive, then we need to create a hybrid in which we will simply incorporate populist methods and nationalistic or socialist ideas into liberalism. And what would be the result or product of that wouldn't have much to do with actual liberalism anymore. And I think that uh, that would be uh, a wrong kind of rebranding. Yeah? We don't need to do that because the liberal crisis, uh, in my estimation, is about policies, not about principles. Um, the crisis of liberal paradigm doesn't go as deep as, as the opponents and critics of liberalism claim that it, w it does. Do you actually realize that pretty much right now, and to the minute, 20 years ago, uh, terrorists struck World Trade Center. Pretty much almost to the minute, I think, 20 years ago. And that was the first crack in, in the liberal paradigm. And after that, many other crises followed. Yeah? Financial crisis, refugee crisis, Eurozone crisis. And because all that happened in the liberal paradigm, those who want to kill liberalism and take liberals, liberalism's place, play the blame game. So if it happened under liberalism, it is liberalism's fault. And if it happened and bad things happened, then liberalism must go. Of course, they're looking for political gains, and what they do is to strike fear into people's hearts by using populist methods. And then they use nationalism, socialism, in some cases, like in Poland, also clericalism, to propose salvations to people. They create a situation in which people are deprived of three major needs, which is security, equality, 
and self-agency, meaning the ability to control your life and what's going on around you in the political process. And the liberalism, the liberal crisis is not actually about principles because those critics don't propose an alternative, not really, not a new paradigm, they don't. Uh, but the problem is that uh, liberals did not come up with uh, policies to counter these criticisms, to find ways and ideas how to restore the feeling that, that these three elemental needs, elementary needs are actually, are actually satisfied. So with security, liberals should work towards showing that migration does not threaten your identity unless you yourself abandon it. And maybe rather this is more of a problem in Western societies. Instead, we should show that an illiberal government, like the one we have in Poland and Hungary, is a threat to your security by, virtually, by the virtual things they do, with your personal freedoms and with, 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 uh, with the justice, in the, uh, the independence of the courts, and so on. With equality, we should be, show that even strong redistribution will not defeat, in, uh, will not bring in equality, uh, but it will rather lead to high public debt and, and inflation, and that it will in the end hit the poor more than others. Instead, we should continue to make, uh, to, to invest more in our public schools and make sure that the uh, that every single child has equal access to a great level of public education. That's how equality is, is, uh, is born, the better path to equality. With self-agency, we should show that helping a populist win an election, a referendum, doesn't put you in control. It doesn't. The British are not more in control with the Brexit happened than they were before. Yeah? Instead, to be more in control of your life, you should have a liberal state that does not interfere with, you, with your private and professional sphere of life, and it allows you to make your own pre-decisions. Plus, we should develop more institutions of direct democracy at the, at the local level of self-government. The mayors should not be deciding whether we're going to put a statue or, or a skate park in some place. Yeah? They should just listen to what the people want and do that. That's more self-agency in a liberal sense of the, of the word. So to do that, we need to strengthen three things. We need to strengthen institutions, public services, and the middle class. But most important is that we eradicate fear and pessimism that was put into people's heart by populists, nationalists, and socialists, and instead put optimism and courage in their hearts, because pessimism is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So courage, courage and Again, courage, that's what we need to revive liberalism. Thank you. Uh, Ricard, the same question to you. Do we need to update or rebrand liberalism in order to make it work? That is a fantastic question. You always put me in a tough position of following Piotr, because after his contributions, I, I, feel, like, I feel like I have to do even more. Um, one good thing about being invited to uh, Eastern and Central Europe, and I have Dr. Detmer During here that uh, kindly invited me to go to Prague, where you work, and, and of course, uh, Liberté uh, asking me to come here. It's to give you a perspective that is more regional. Again, question of regionality. And try to, with that to share something with you. I'm, go I'm going to just shift a little bit because this is again about rebranding. And in my opinion, we should add a coma, but, after saying, I'm liberal. I'm liberal, coma, but. What kind of liberal I am? Am I a progressive liberal? Am I a conservative liberal? You just mentioned conservative liberal. I am a, cla I am a classical liberal. I am a social liberal. Because what happens is that when even are you a new neoliberal? What happens is that when we put everything in the same bag, which is the bag of liberalism, then this could be counterproductive. Let me tell you why, and again, because I bring a perspective that is local. In Portugal, we have democracy for 45 years. We had a dictatorship, everybody knows this. We had a revolution, and we had democracy. And we didn't have liberalism at all, because liberal 
liberalism and liberal was forbidden words. For historical reasons, I don't have time to get into that. Even if the socialists and the social democrats, which are the two parties in the middle, they are basically liberal parties, but they, they don't say they, they are, which makes sense. Now, what happens is that, and, and this is for, you know, uh, this has been broadcasted on the internet, so there may be people in Portugal watching this. This is not a critique of anything in particular. I'm just making a point. This is a statement of fact, so I don't want people to get upset with what I'm going to say next. Then we have a liberal party. And actually, they have the name liberal in the name of the party. So what happened was that there was this slot of electorate. There was this group of the population that were like, finally, a liberal solution for governance. They didn't describe it as well as they should. They didn't put the coma, but. Because what happens is that after we had neoliberalism during the crisis, and when Troika came to Portugal and said, here's, all your, here's the money to have the lights on, but you have to do this, 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 and, that, and this and that. And this was presented to the popula Portuguese population as neoliberalism. And we're still paying for that. And now what happens is that we have a political party, which is a liberal party, again, the big bag. And this political party is a classic liberalism, almost going to libertarianism. So we have a lot of people in Portugal right now, and I don't know what is the reality in your countries, but have a lot of people who are disillusioned. They are frustrated. Because this is not the kind of liberalism that I identify. This was the, liberal, the liberalism that was promised to me. I will never vote liberals again. And this could go either way, because I can start a political party in Portugal. I can say, hey, look at my party, we're liberals. And in my manifesto, I'm clearly a progressive liberal, clearly a social liberal. And then I have part of the Portuguese population is going to say, no, 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 less state, less taxes, less regulations, please, because that's my kind of liberalism. All right, then let's define between ourselves what kind of liberals we are. Let's not give up of the term, of course. It's an operational term, Piotr say the culture, the history, the importance of the, pol of the political ideology, it's undeniable. So let's, let's not try to come up with new terms. There's no need for that. But in my opinion, rebranding in here means be, again, the narrative, be more specific, and don't go into the error of saying, we're this and then you're not. And then people will look at you and say, well, here it is, the liberals again. <laughs> They're not to be trusted. And I would love to have the opinion of the audience and my panel panelists, because I've been brewing on this idea, but I would love to, have, to know what you think. So thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Actually, this is a very interesting point. I would be also interested to know what the other think about it. But perhaps now let's move on. I'll just like to finish the second round, and then we can uh, get back to it within the consequent discussion. Uh, Sharka, so let's get back to you. Uh, you spoke about the impacts of the pandemic on, on liberalism, and it's often being said that uh, every crisis also means an opportunity. So would you say uh, that we can also see the pandemic as an opportunity how to perhaps spur liberal reforms? Well, in many ways, there were many issues that provide a sort of blueprint for how we can say how to rebrand liberalism and the pandemic and issues uh, which arose even before it uh, show clear need for continuous reform and adaptation. And scientists have all clearly stated that this will not be the last pandemic and moving forward, liberalism must not... Uh, must not return to normalcy, it must evolve, and it must look to the past, uh, mistakes and success, and to create something with long-term logic uh, supported by moral goals. Uh, climate change is a perfect example of this, and it requires uh, cooperation, uh, planning for the future, and changing uh, scenery, and uh, reconsidering what individuals and big corporations uh, should be allowed to do in exchange for the possible detriment of money. And uh, regulation will be the key uh, to protect citizens and future generations. So overall, uh, rebranding liberalism means learning from the past uh, and to build a better future 
for everyone in it. And it means facing the challenges uh, which it has uh, and addressing them with both the values of liberalism in mind and considering uh, our consideration for current and upcoming issues to continuously become something more dynamic or resilient and uh, sustainable. Individuals, uh, particularly the youth, uh, must come together, especially in the post-pandemic world. And we must hold our governments uh, accountable to have more transparent and effective institutions and appropriately utilize the tools uh, liberalism and liberal democracy has provided us to achieve increased equality uh, through solidarity and action. Thanks a lot, Sharka. And speaking about opportunities, and then Daniel, now it's your opportunity to take us on a journey to your expertise. Uh, you are focusing on political participation in civil society. So where do you see the role of civil society when rebranding or reviving liberalism? Well, I was prepared for the question because he <laughs> shared the question with me and uh, I, should, I, should, I should admit it. Well, uh, I think basically, yeah, when it comes to the coma, what kind of liberalism? Uh, there are types of liberalism. Uh, if we, uh, if you it took into perspective like the historical heritage, and I don't mean 19th century, but, but recent historical heritage, like in Poland and in Hungary, uh, or in other East Central European countries, that uh, the, so to say, civil society, which was, I think, Sodernosh was a part of a civil society, which was built up to have parallel structures and to challenge the communist structures. So people use, they say that you can't reform communism, you can't make, you know, just, uh, just a, a human face for socialism, you have to challenge communism with the help of, of uh, of an autonomous space for people where people can interact. And this is what we call civil society. So it was actually, basically it was, uh, it was discovered, it was a rediscovery of civil society again in East Central Europe during the 80s. And this was basically a liberal idea that people can come together, they have their own press, uh, the, um, which is printed with, without the help of the state. Uh, they have their own organizations, maybe not formalized organizations, but still they have their organizations. And this creates something which is, which is maybe not just, it's not only about politics, but it it's reaches beyond politics. Uh, it's also about culture. In, in Czechoslovakia, for example, culture was more important than like in, like in Poland, because in Poland the people there established uh, uh, independent trade unions, but in, in the Czechoslovakia they established cultural organizations rather than, uh, than directly political uh, organizations. So my point is that when it comes to the civil society, when it comes to the roots of civil society in Central Europe, and sorry, I'm just talking from my perspective, <laughs> then uh, it's basically, I think it was uh, a liberal, uh, it was, from its roots, it was liberal because it, it, it meant that people who decide to be there, autonomous people are coming together and they are jointly, they, are, they are just uh, uh, want to achieve something. They want to achieve something together to make, uh, to make a difference. I think this is, this is what you, it's, there's no coma in that <laughs> if, if it's about liberalism. But, when you come to the, uh, to the idea of civil society, I think for a lot of people, and we have actually data for that, for at least in Hungary, for the major of the people, civil society is rather about charity. So it's not about, not about being political or, 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 or uh, uh, to challenge something which is in the politics. It's a depoliticized civil society. And this is in accordance what Viktor Orban says. In 2014, in his speech about illiberalism, a lot of people noted that he has been talking about the illiberal democracy. But he also mentioned that the people who are working for NGOs and also for civil society organizations who are getting support or help or who are actually just you know, working together with, uh, with other NGOs abroad, 
they are political activists. This is what he said. So that the charity civil, uh, civil society is something which is depoliticized. It's, you know, it's about cultural heritage, which is important, of course, you know, helping you know, people and, uh, you know, just helping for puppies and then, you know, just say, all right. So this is what people like, which, which is, I think, okay. So a lot of people, they want to avoid to be in conflict and politics is always conflictual. So they don't want to actually interfere with politics because ah, that's something which doesn't bring people together, but it rather detaches people. Uh, but at the same time, what Viktor Orban says when it comes to the civil society, that it should be depoliticized, and those people who are you know, challenging politicians, watchdog organizations, for example, uh, human rights organizations, they are doing politics, so they should have their own political parties, and they are not a part of the civil society. And I think it's, uh, it's kind of a threat. Uh, the question is, can be civil society depoliticized? But people is going to join, people are gonna donate uh, if, 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 if civil society is depoliticized. Uh, and I think it's a challenge also for liberalism because basically I think which is very important for liberalism is the uh, voluntary association of, of people who like to make things better, maybe not better, but from their perspective better. So if you regard liberal democracy from a Tocquevillian perspective, associations are very important. But what comes if associations are depoliticized? If they are, you know, you don't have to interfere with politics, it's not your business, it's only about charity. So I think this is, this is when it comes to the rebranding of, of liberalism, I think it's also a kind of a challenge. And I see also good practices, because we should be also optimistic. I think the NEOS party um, from Austria, that's, that's a good example how they could actually channel uh, the people who would like to be uh, volunteers, and, but they don't want to be you know, party members, but still they could actually uh, bring these people together and they could give them, uh, uh, they, could, they can discuss politics, uh, they have these people around the, the NEOS party, and, and they can make these people active without uh, you know, any kind of political or ideological indoctrination. So I think this could be also a challenge because with the participation, with the participation of the people, I think there's, uh, uh, there's no way of, 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 of rebranding uh, liberalism, there's no way of challenging populism. That's actually the important role of civil society to work as a bridge between politics and, and citizens. Okay, thank you very much for that. And now we have about 15 minutes left. So I would like to give the opportunity to you to ask your questions. So please, whoever has the question to our panelists, yeah, raise your hand and we will bring you the microphone. It's on the way. And Mr. Turing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this very interesting conversation. My name is Adit Zbut. I'm from the Polish Academy of Sciences. And uh, I just very briefly wanted to reflect upon what uh, Ricardo said about the issue of social inequality and the impact of it on, on the success of, of illiberalism. Uh, and I tend to agree that cultural backlash and everything which has anything to do with cultural backlash is even more important perhaps in Central and Eastern Europe than, um, I don't know, ex existential anxieties. But uh, just because we are ahead of elections in Hungary, let me bring in another aspect. And I think it's important because um, at least in Hungary, the government became very creative and efficient to co-opt the elections with coercive vote buying. So what they're doing is that they're intimidating um, the most deprived strata of the society in the Hungarian countryside, and they are just threatening them with the withdrawal of social transfers, uh, the possibility to have access to work first program and so on and so forth. So there is a tremendous amount of informal threatening in the system. And uh, so 
these people tend to vote for Orban no matter what, because they're simply concerned about, you know, having food on the table or just having access to job opportunities. So my, my question is, uh, what would be your advice to, uh, uh, for, for the Hungarian opposition to do when it comes to winning the hearts and minds of the most deprived strata of the society? Outside of bigger cities, where of course they're the least interested in, I don't know, Afghan refugee rights or you know, rule of law issues in general. Thank you. So was it a question to Ricardo or? That's right. It's for the Hungarian, right? For Hungarian. It's for the Hungarian. <laughs> you pushed it to me? We do as well, so maybe uh, Eddie just knows my answer, so that's why yours would be more interesting. Well, first of all, it's great to have Edith Good here. She's a very important person in this process, and you guys should read what she writes and, and the way she thinks. So it's good to have you here. Uh, first of all. And then the second thing is, I, I follow Hungarian politics as close as I can. And as you said, it's amazing how people vote against their own interests. And sometimes I make the transfer to what I see in the United States, and it just drives me mad. So, so, because we're looking for solutions, practical solutions. So answering your question, what would I do? First of all, I would give up a part of the population. I wouldn't spend money with them, I wouldn't spend time with them, I wouldn't spend energy with them because they are deplorables. And it's amazing how Hillary Clinton paid a price so big for saying something that is so real. They are depro depro de sorry, deplorables. So no need to try to get those people. Now, regarding those people in uh, regional areas in, Hun in Hungary that vote Fidesz, Again, it's the narrative, it's the history that we're going to tell them. It's the way we approach. And I know that in Hungary, they just listen to one voice, which is the master's voice. It's the state-run media that keeps giving them the propaganda that will make them vote Fidesz until the sun burns out. So I know that there's a lot of work we've done with this, and Daniel can talk about this, about social media, about NGOs, about trying to reach those people. But if you reach them, See how they react. If they're like, I'm going to vote Orban no matter what, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to reach those people. Now, those people that I'd say, oh, really, that's interesting. Is there anything else that you can give me? Then give them something else. I, I didn't fully answer your question. I know that because it's very specific, but that'll be my starting point. I did a kind of a private research, uh, but it was also published at the Republican Institute after the 2018 uh, election. I was focusing on the on the settlements, which had only uh, I don't know how you put it in English, uh, one uh, one district to vote. You know, just just one school. Like these are settlements with a population from 50 to 200, uh, really smaller settlements in in the country, and. I just, I just realized that the Fidesz had the breakthrough in the small settlements, not in 2018 or in 14 or whatever, but in 2002. After an agrarian party, uh, they just disappeared from the, from the political scene. So, what, what I, what, so my point is that there is also a tradition to vote for the right, to vote for Fidesz in these very small settlements. Uh, and of course, if the opposition want to have a breakthrough uh, at the general election next year, if they want to uh, succeed in the segmented districts as well, they have to put a lot of effort in, um, in getting out the vote in, in the smaller settlements. But at the same time, uh, there's another kind of work which should be uh, put there is which is maybe a more like a, it's not about mobilization of voters, it's not about uh, uh, bringing together organizations, but just to realize what happens actually in the countryside. What's, what are actually these, these words which are dividing? People are divided. There's very different experiences that are made in the big city and in the smaller settlements. Recently, I'm just very curious what is going to happen because of the COVID-19 virus, because people are moving to the countryside. Uh, because of home officing, 
people, people start to, to buy houses in the countryside. So what's going to happen actually with these local societies if, you know, these, uh, you know, there, there are two kind of mustaches in Hungary, the hipster mustache and the nationalist mustache. So what happens actually when the two kind of mustaches are coming together? So I think it's an important, it's an interesting question, but at least there should be put a lot of effort into that to realize how, what, what about these societies? What are actually the people, how do, if we are talking about clientelism, uh, which is actually a, a good point, uh, what you've been editing talking about, it's, it's water clientelism, but should or shouldn't be a decision of a fellow voter, of a, you know, a fellow citizen, should we respect it, their decisions and how they vote? It's, it's basic principle of democracy. Can we put it into question how they vote? They vote because, you know, just a sack of potatoes or they vote because of uh, a long time, you know, uh, reforms in, uh, in the healthcare system or the education. How can you decide it? How can you blame other people? How do they vote? It's, I think it's, it's, it's what, need, what we are witnessing nowadays, I think it's, uh, when we are talking about the rebranding of liberalism, there's also, which is our happening, is a new structural change in, um, in the public sphere. People that have their voice, people can then comment. They can, they can comment under what, what the politician says that you can f up, uh, go to hell, whatever. So this is, the, the public sphere is becoming more democrat. And actually, I think liberals should, uh, should use this. Uh, they should, they should uh, uh, take now the opportunity that people want to have more voice, the public sphere is changing. And this is, I think it's not a threat, but it could be an opportunity for liberals as well that uh, uh, there's more democracy here. Thank you. I think we had one more question here, right? Good evening, everyone. My name is Łukasz Dombros, and I am a PhD student at the Warsaw School of Economics. And, um, my question concerns uh, one country that's a pretty surprising example of liberal success, uh, also in terms of politics, I mean Estonia. In, in Estonia, a party that's uh, really strongly attached to the values of classical liberalism, I mean uh, the Reform Party, is being the strongest political party in the country and it, it has uh, really, really large popular support. And uh, my question is in particular to Elena, as she is in, in, in Lithuania, so in a pretty similar country in terms of popu population and uh, geopolitical situation, what we can learn from uh, Estonian liberals to, to be as successful as they are? Elena, so I would ask you for just rather short answer, two minutes, if you manage. Uh, that is really a great uh, surprise and a great inspiration because the biggest challenge of a liberal is to get elected. And today we have two liberal parties in, in our coalition government, and it, I see them moving through this great, great challenge. So Estonians were really very pragmatic in making the reforms, in not getting the approval of the EU, for example, for, for their profit tax reform and other reforms. and by providing really good uh, fruits of those reforms and by being uh, uh, also non-corrupted, uh, creating really minimum and efficient state, uh, they really got the support of population. So I, I really uh, adore them and I really uh, like all other politicians to be like them. Thank you, and I think we still have time for one very short question. I think Mr. Dering. Thanks, uh, probably not a very short question, but maybe an economic one, so maybe Elena, uh, but someone else, I don't know. Well, we were all talking about, well, how it was 1989, uh, uh, dismantling socialism, then neoliberalism, whatever this is, I don't know, but if you look, at today, it's, I don't think we have a controversy between market economy and 
planned economy, between private property, state property, but I think, I may exaggerate a little bit, the most dominant form of economy is cronyism. Mm. A private economy that is somehow intermingled with the state. <laughs> and those democracies that are most in danger now, like let's say Hungary or Poland or so, are most advanced in this type of economy. Now you always have this kind of uh, mogul who will buy up newspapers and then silence them, something like this. And uh, 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 I would suppose that some programs that run under Green Deal or otherwise where the state now interferes very much into the economy will end uh, the achievements of a market economy. Often it's mixed with neoliberalism, but it's not the same. Uh, liberalism meant that you separate political and economic power. If you put it together and have private property with political power, then you have feudalism. It may, may look shiny and they have computers now, but it's feudalism. Uh, do we have a program against this, how to dismantle this feudalism? Elena, would you like to react very shortly? Uh, thank you, Dietmar. Uh, yes, uh, we always have to remind to people that any function that they give to the state means uh, possibility of uh, corruption and involving, you know, private properties in gaining the benefits, not by se serving the consumers, but by getting the benefits in the state corridors. So always reminding, using every scandal to explain that this is not because of the free market, but because of the corrupted functions of the state. <clears throat> thank you. And I think that with this, our time is up. So let me thank to our panelists for sharing your inspiring thoughts. I think that all of us now have a lot of food for thought. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you also for, for, for your attention, for your questions, and also many thanks to all those who are watching, uh, watching us online. And I wish you to enjoy the rest of the program of Freedom Games and have a nice evening. Thank you. And thank you for the moderation. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.